their toads, you know? So yeah. they're pretty amazing. The, the male germ, uh, ger well, germinates, I guess, fertilizes the eggs yeah. as they come out of the female. And you can actually watch it happen. I watched, it was incredible. It was really cool. Kind of an interesting thing. My so, big female toad was on the side of the house today. She wasn't near any ponds. I don't know where she yeah. ate. They leave, they're gone. They come and they're here for a day or two and then they're gone. So anyway. I think you're staying cool. Can you hear the background noise? <laughs> yep. uh -huh. That's peepers. Are yeah. they twirling? They're twirling? Mm -hmm. I can't tell you what they were doing. It was at 3.30 in the morning and uh, it was loud enough to keep me up for, for a little while. It could be the toads. They, they, they kind of trill. They got kind of yeah, like, that's, those aren't peepers. The peepers are earlier. There are a few yeah. toads in there. But... It could be a pickerel, pickerel frog. Um, Lang Elliott has some real good toad calls on, um, on the web. If you go to Lang Elliott and look he has really good whole variety everything that we have around here yeah. anyway. all righty why don't we why don't we get started with the meeting since we're i think we're all here we've got a good sized group tonight um i think i keep forgetting to do this so why don't we start by going around and introducing ourselves because we are getting some people that i don't know um, so I'm going to direct uh, going around the circle and everyone um, just give your name um, if you want to specify what part of the town you live in um, and uh, what, what you are looking forward to in this process. So my name is David. Uh, I am the town planner. Uh, I've been with the town for about six months and um, looking forward to getting some zoning that um, we can agree is an improvement over what we have now. Um, the next person, how about Claire? Uh, I'm Claire Futrell and I'm chair of the Conservation Advisory Council and I live on Comfort Road. And I wonder if I could put in a plea for people to mute themselves when they're not talking because there's quite a bit of clattering going on right now. Uh, many thanks. Excellent. Thanks, Claire. Um, how about next, Joel? I see he's unmuted already. Yes, I'm Joel Ganyan, uh, chair of the group and also town supervisor who lives in the middle of West Danby. Thanks, Joel. Uh, Rhonda. Rhonda Roaring. I live on South Danby Road. Uh, next, how about uh, Corbett? And then Nancy. Um, I I'm Corbett, Margaret Corbett, um, and I live in the very southern tip of the town of Danby, um, off of South Danby Road. Nancy? Uh, hi, my name is Nancy Metzger, and I live um, in a beautiful neighborhood up on Marsh Road. And we also, I have my studio down where the Danby uh, store was, it's the Danby Gallery. So anyway, um, stop by. <laughs> Thanks, Nancy. How about um, next, Leslie and Jonathan? Oh, you're muted, Leslie. Leslie yeah. Connor, I live at, on uh, Durfee Hill Road. Um, I'm on the town board. And Jonathan? Jonathan Zisk, I live in the same place she does. I'm uh, on the... Conservation Advisory Committee, and I'm here because I think we can make Danby a better town. Thanks, Jonathan. How about um, Lynn and then Barbara? I'm Lynn Rapp, and I live on East Miller Road. Great. Barbara, thanks, Lynn. Sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, I'm not Barbara, oh. <laughs> but I'm using Barbara's computer. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, you're Pat. We can tell now with the, you have the light shining behind you there. Pat makes it hard to. <laughs> uh, <laughs> my oh, name is Pat Woodworth, <laughs> and I live on Gunderman Road. 
And I'm glad to see we're looking at this because it does look like since it hasn't been done in 30 years, it seemed quite appropriate that it be readjusted. Thanks, Pat. Uh, how about Ivan Ross and then uh, Ted? Hi, everyone. Uh, Ivan Ross, uh, nice to meet you, Lynn. I'm a neighbor up the road on East Miller Road. Um, and I'm interested to get involved now that I'm here and living in Danby. Thanks, Ivan. Ted? You're muted, Ted. I'm Ted, and I live at the corner of Comfort and Love in the Danby. All right, how about uh, David McDermott and then uh, Jethro Forbes? Uh, hi, I'm <clears throat> sorry, I'm David. Uh, we live at the corner, of, right, right near the corner of Miller Road, West Miller and Danby Road. Just want to see what's going on and get a feel for how things are moving in, the, in this committee. Thanks, David. Good to have you. Jethro? Hi, I'm Jethro. Uh, my family and I live on East Miller right at Marsh Road. And um, we're, yeah, we're interested in the process and hopefully uh, seeing some, some productive meetings and some nice outcomes. Thanks, Jethro. How about Kim and then Catherine? Hi, I'm Kim Nichman. My husband, Russ, is actually out mowing now. We have a couple hundred acres, some on Steam Mill Road and some more on Bald Hill Road. My husband's an avid hunter and um, does a lot of wildlife conservation um, land management. Thanks, Kim. Catherine? Hi, I'm Catherine Hunter. I live on West King. Uh, close to um, Sandbank and close to West Jersey Hill Road intersection. And I am extremely interested in all that happens in Danby. <laughs> I'm trying. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Catherine. And I think the only person I missed is Sarah. Sarah, I don't know if you're really there. Oh, you are really there. Yeah, I'm there. Hi. <laughs> uh, I'm Sarah Schnabel. I'm on the town board. And I live on Danby Road, just north of... Uh, Miller. Great, thanks. Um, so it's good we to got see. Toby. Oh, did I skip Toby? Sorry, you Toby. You forgot Toby. You skipped me, David. I'm hurt. Uh, Toby Dean, I'm on the BZA and I live in North Danby on Yaple Road, a suburban neighborhood, according to this, to the map. That's all. Do you have feelings about that, Toby? Uh, well, we knew it was coming, but we were the only <laughs> house on the road when I moved here. So yep. we're used to change, but we need to uh, be on top of it. Yeah. All right. Well, um, I want to thank everyone for being here, um, especially the new people. It's great to see people in the town getting involved in this process. And uh, just so you all know, um, this is an open conversation. Uh, we do try to keep comments relatively short so that no one except me is monopolizing the meeting. Um, I get to make longer comments um, and maybe Joel will. Um, but so if you could keep, you know, comments relatively brief and on topic, that's useful. If people go really off topic, I, I do sometimes mute people. It's nothing personal, just trying to keep the meeting on track. Um, so where we are in this process, um, just a few reminders. The town has instituted what's called um, a land use moratorium on subdivisions in what is currently the low density residential zone, which is most of the town um, outside of the hamlets. Um, that moratorium lasts until the end of the year and it gives the town time to work on new zoning um, that will uh, work with the goals that the town has, especially the goals of the comprehensive plan, but also other goals that um, people want in the town in terms of um, preservation and um, deciding what kind of development can happen where and where development should be focused. And the big overarching theme of that is that uh, the town would like to focus development in the hamlets, in Central Danby Hamlet and West Danby Hamlet, um, and see less sprawl in the rest of the town. And there are some areas that are more important to preserve and some areas that are less important to preserve or are already built out. And that's kind of the framework of the zoning um, that we've come to and that we're working with. So this group is focused on all of the areas in the town that are currently low density residential. 
It's been meeting every other week um, on Fridays. There's another group, the Hamlet Working Group, um, that's doing what it sounds like. It's focused on the Hamlets. It's working on the zoning for those, and it meets on the Fridays that this group doesn't meet. So it alternates back and forth. Um, with that said, for this meeting, I shared two documents, and I'm going to um, put them up on screen one at a time um, and talk through them quickly, and then we'll get into conversation. All right, so the first document that I shared uh, is the, the map of the whole town. Um, there's a, a couple of things that I want to point out about this before we get into deeper conversation about it. Um, the first is what it says right at the top, working draft. Um, this has gone through several iterations already, but it is not done. If you don't like it, if there's something about it that bothers you, let's talk about it. Nothing here is written in stone. Um, the point of this process is to start with something that's really sketchy and rough and to end up at something that we can mostly agree on. Um, that said, uh, there's a couple different things going on on this map. There are base colors, uh, which are the zones, and there are also some overlay zones. So the town currently has um, an overlay zone for um, aquifer pr protection for high vulnerability aquifers. In addition to that, the group has talked about having a habitat corridor overlay zone um, and stream corridor overlay zones that would be 100 feet wide for perennial or year round streams and 50 feet wide for seasonal streams. Um, and you can see those on this map. Um, I'm gonna turn them off for now, unless we need to talk about them specifically because they do make it hard to see things. Uh, I'm gonna zoom in and talk through each of the zones quickly. So we have the zones on this map um, listed in order of uh, density and order of protection. So um, existing plan development, um, those are areas that were specifically permitted by the town to have their own zoning rules. So some of them are residential subdivisions, some of them are commercial areas, they have their own set of rules. We're not touching those in this process. Uh, the next zone is the Hamlet core. It's what it sounds like, the middle um, densest and most commercial part of the Hamlet. Um, in the, so we have a few things allowed there um, by rights that you can just um, build if you are a landowner. Um, we don't need to talk too much about the Hamlet. Um, there's other things that require uh, additional review in the Hamlet neighborhood. It's similar to the Hamlet core, but more residential. There's less commercial uses allowed there. Um, but still, both of those zones, the goal is we want to focus development there, make it as easy um, for people to build there instead of other parts in the town as possible. Next, the areas that are currently low density residential, we have suburban character, rural character two, rural character one, and high priority preservation. Suburban character is mostly areas that have been significantly built out under the existing zoning. The existing zoning allows lots as small as two acres. Um, and so a significant portion of that zone is clusters of lots that were subdivided from larger lots and really built out um, in more of a suburban way than some other parts of the town. Um, and you know, like I said, these are flexible and we can have conversations about things that should go in or come out of each of these zones. Rural character two is places that the town um, would like to see preserved, uh, but are willing to have more flexibility. So this zone reduces the development allowed compared to the low density residential zone, um, but it is supposed to have more uses and less review than the next two zones that have additional parameters. Uh, rural character one um, is areas of the town that have steep slopes, that have environmentally important um, habitat areas that are UNAs, um, that have contiguous uh, habitat, forests, uh, those kinds of things. They're the parts of the town where um, not only does the town want to reduce the density of development that can happen there, but also have some additional review. Um, and then high priority preservation is areas that are most important to preserve and where we're willing to put the most 
um, significant controls. This is exclusively at this point um, state or municipal or land trust owned parcels plus parcels that people voluntarily add to that zone. So uh, we're not forcing this zone on anyone um, and recognize that it is the most restrictive. It requires a 25 acre minimum lot size with the goal of we really wanna keep the lots big and open in that zone. Uh, so with that quick understanding of those, um, some of the things that have changed since the last meeting, uh, I got feedback that we don't need to um, keep the entire lot in a zone um, when the lots are long and skinny and extend in a way that we might not want the whole lot in one zone. Um, a lot of that applied to the hamlets. So some of the longer lots that were in the hamlets have been uh, the part that's in the hamlet zone has been abbreviated a little bit to more closely match these circles. The circles that you see there are half mile and quarter mile circles. Um, half mile being generally the distance that people will bike for an everyday activity. Um, lots of people will bike a lot farther than that for occasional things, but if you're going to get around um, doing a significant amount of daily stuff, that's what people will do. A quarter mile is really what people will walk. Um, obviously, people aren't going to get most of their daily needs met in either the hamlets currently um, walking or biking, but it's a goal for the future for long term. So that's why we're using those sizes and areas. Um, okay. Uh, other than that, uh, I've done some cleaning up of uh, particularly the suburban neighborhood zones where there were parcels that ended up in it because of kind of a computational analysis. And I, I did some more subjective looking at it and putting in um, areas where there were clusters and removing parcels that didn't make sense. Um, and we can talk more about places that meet those criteria uh, going forward. I did leave two questions here. These questions were on the map last time. Are there additional high priority conservation areas that you see um, that should go into that? Um, or are there other areas that are zoned incorrectly that we should change a parcel from one zone to another? From there, we can jump uh, to the table and then we'll come back and we'll start, start having some conversation. I just want to explain what's on the table that you all looked at. Leslie, did you want to say something before we move on? No. Okay. At, at what point should we should we hold questions till you're finished? Yes. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone has uh, an overview of everything that's on our plate today, and then we can can start talking about what it is. Um, so this table. Uh, is a, a start at coming up with the various rules that we will have for these new zones. Um, we started with identifying the general areas in the town that the zones would apply to help people kind of wrap their heads around um, what we were doing and, and how we would want rules to apply in different areas. Um, the way that zoning generally works, um, you have bulk and area, parameters, um, how big a building can be and where it can be on a lot and how big a lot needs to be. Um, and then you have uses. Right now, we're not really talking about uses. Um, we're looking at the bulk and area requirements first. Uh, and a lot of this comes down to what amount of subdividing is possible on the lot, uh, especially on large lots that exist. So in this table, we have uh, shown the four proposed zones and then the existing zone. Um, and there's some columns for each of these. Um, and I've got questions by email about these. So uh, I assume they're a little confusing and I wanna make sure that everyone understands the max average density for subdivisions before transfer of development rates. We've got two somewhat complicated things going on there. So first um, we can talk about transfer of development rights. This is the concept that um, each lot has a certain amount of development allowed, uh, but you can sell the development right that is allowed on your lot to someone else and they can put it on their lot and you can keep your lot open and not develop it. 
Um, this is particularly useful when we hear from people, gosh, I really don't want to develop my land, but I need to get the money out of it. I need to get some money out of it. I need to you know, sell off a lot um, to be able to pay a bill or something like that. Um, the town wants to enable you to sell the right to develop without actually developing on your lot, um, which can end up clustering development in other places. So what we're talking about here is the max average density before you do any of that. Um, which basically comes down to how many lots can you make from your existing lot. Uh, the way it works now, you can have one lot for every five acres. Um, and the reason that I've worded it this way is you can have one lot for up to five acres, but any lots that you create can be as small as two acres. So if you had 10 acres, that entitles you to two lots you can make one of them five, two acres and the other eight acres, and those average out to an average density of one lot per five acres. Uh, so the, those change relative to the zone that you're in. Um, we can see the high priority preservation zone is one um, residential unit or development right for every 25 acres. The rural character zones are one per 10 acres and the suburban neighborhood is one lot up to two residential units per five acres, which is the current uh, zoning. In the lot sizes, this is how big or small a lot can be. Um, in the suburban neighborhood, we've got, a, it has to be at least two acres. That's the, the same as the rule currently is. In rural character one or two, um, we talked about, um, we really want lots to mostly be more than 10 acres, but um, if you're using up development rights, um, we would and dividing off lots for residential development, we'd like those lots to be as small as possible. Um, so there are limits from the health department um, based on septic, but we would, so we would like to see those lots um, less than two acres or greater than 10 acres. Uh, the next set of parameters is setbacks. Um, setbacks are how far from the property line you have to put your buildings. Um, so that's from the front of the property line, from the side of the property, or from the rear of the property. Uh, we've also talked about a new setback, which is the distance that a new cluster of buildings can be from existing homes. So because we're encouraging people who want to do some development to uh, cluster those development rights in a smaller development, um, there's concern that we would wanna keep them away from people who currently live in the neighborhood who aren't used to having a cluster of homes close together. Um, so we've got a, a setback distance there. The max development rights transferred into a lot means in this zone, you have a lot and you're gonna buy development rights from someone. We don't want you to buy an infinite amount of development rights and build a skyscraper in the middle of the rural character one zone. Um, so th there's a limit of how many um, rights to develop a residential unit you can transfer into a lot in those zones. Um, there is a development rights multiplier. So this means that if you sell a development right from a high priority preservation zone to another zone where we're more okay with seeing development happen, um, it could be worth more. It could be worth four uh, four development units instead of one. David, on my screen, I don't see that column. Is that? Uh... Maybe because my screen is too wide for your screen. So how's that? I don't see any change. Yeah, it's the same on mine. I, I don't a, know if you, you have a scroll, scroll right in. Um, it's kind of, I mean, I was looking at this earlier and I had to scroll right and left in order to see, but then if you know, you scroll to the right, you can't see what's on the left and vice versa. But. Uh, my we see the, the elevator bar at the right. My screen sharing paused for some reason, so I'm going to go back to it here. How's that? Oh, that's better. <laughs> all right. Uh, so we talked about the multiplier. We'll talk about all these more. I just want to make sure everyone yes. has a base understanding. Um, OK, the max residential units per lot. So um, this is including any development rights you buy from other lots, uh, we do, or I am suggesting that we put a cap um, because I think there was some concern, you know, that nobody wants to suddenly have a hundred unit 
um, condo building pop up next to them. So these are based on the zone, um, how many units are maximum, including transfer development rights. And then depending on the zone, um, whether or not a uh, simple residential building would require site plan review. Um, currently, that's not required in any of these areas. Um, and there's a suggestion that we should require it. And so I've kind of meted that out differently depending on the zone. Uh, as far as what site plan would be looking for, we've got a list down here of parameters. Um, and then in the table, I've also listed the overlay zones that we've discussed and the kind of a general approach to the requirements that we have talked about for what could not be done or what additional restrictions those overlay zones would provide. And that I think gets everyone a, a quick intro um, to how this works. Uh, for people who haven't been at the past meetings, um, this is the first time we've looked at this table. This is combining concepts that we've, different people have presented in different meetings. Um, so, you know, I think it will change. I think it will be uh, a conversation about if this is getting us where we want to go or isn't or how it can change. So, you know, don't, don't hold back with your feedback. I think we want to hear and discuss um, everything about these two pieces. Um, I would like to start with, uh, maybe we can start with very general questions on either the table or the map, and then I'd like to focus on the table and then spend some time on the map second, if that's okay. And I see Ivan has a hand up. Uh, just a clarification, the circles you had overlaid on the map, that was just a distance marker, and then it was the color shading that was indicating the zones, correct? Exactly, that's correct. Okay. And then in terms of this, these two columns you had just highlighted here, to make sure I'm understanding, so like rural character two, if it's somebody has a 50 acre lot, they could make four two acre parcels and then keep the remaining 42 acres, and that would still be one per 10 acres average. So a 50 acre lot could suddenly have two, you know, four two acre lots plus the one main 42 acre lot. Is that how this uh, is being set up? Yes. So okay. that that the goal then is that then the development rights are used up. So kind of in exchange for a little more density than you might expect, you then also have this preserved open space of the larger. Yeah, person. it caps out and ends at some point. Gotcha. Yeah. Um, and in terms of reduce, I see the the front yard amount dropped in this, and the rear yard has kind of. Uh, grown for some. What's the uh, thought behind pushing things towards the road versus having a little more frontage like gap if people want their houses set? or that's just a minimum? Yes. So you, you've touched on two things there. Um, it is just a minimum and um, it may be counterintuitive why I put the front yard getting smaller. So we've had some debate in this group about the merits of the way things look versus the way things perform. Um, keeping the building as close to the street as possible is really the best for ecology, right? It keeps the back of the lot as contiguous habitat, you know, unless you cut it all down and mow it. Um, <laughs> it's the least fragmenting way to develop a lot. But it looks like you developed a lot. So there are some people who would prefer, even if it's more detrimental, uh, we'd rather have the lots more hidden so that when you drive down the street, it feels like nobody lives there, even though your house is, you know, hidden in the trees a little bit back. Um, so in the, um, the rural character two and the rural character one, I wanted to make a little more room, um, especially when we're talking about um, areas that have steep slopes or other environmental constraints um, uh, to have the building closer to the street um, and uh, preserve more of the space in the back, uh, which is what where those numbers come from. Um, the the suburban neighborhood, you know, having the houses set back is you know it's about privacy and it's about creating that kind of neighborhood. It's the rules that we've had. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, that's helpful to clarify. Thank you. That's all for right now. You bet. Um, so three people. I see electronic hands up. Ted, Toby, and mm -hmm. Sarah. Maybe we can go in that order. Okay, I, ha I have quite a number of questions, so I'd be perfectly happy to ask them one at a time and come back 
after uh, why don't you that. start with general something things that are very general and we want to get more specific as we go on oh everything specific um i like to have you picture something and and see if you have an answer to this question it has to do with side yards and setbacks um let's imagine a lot you know, a typical lot, it's probably deeper than it is wide road front, road frontage wide. And so on the day you pass the zoning, uh, the front yard is defined as the part that's nearest the road, the, facing the road. Let's say a developer comes in, it might not even need to be a developer, but let's say that an access road is accepted by the town by whatever means and then lots are sold off of it. How would that change? Or you know, is there a way to protect against the fact that what used to be a rear yard, which are fairly extensive, relatively speaking, all has, could all of a sudden become a side yard? You're turning, by putting the, the new access road in there, you're turning a lot sideways. Um, I, don't see how you would, I don't think you would turn a lot sideways, but well, I, it, I do see what you're saying about um, having development behind existing development. Um, well, it's not, it's not just that, it's not just that, you know, imagine uh, you have a long, a deep, but relatively narrow plot, uh, property. And let's just imagine that it's big enough so that you could run a road right down the middle of it. What you started with for the neighbor who's behind, behind the length of the lot, you started with a three, well, let's use the, the two or 300 foot rear yard. That's a protection for the neighbor behind. When you run the road down the middle of it and branch houses off either side, perhaps through development transfer rights, whatever, all of a sudden the front yard for those houses is the new road. Yeah. And what used to be the two or 300 foot rear yard has all of a sudden become a 20 foot side yard. Uh, Sorry, I know that that's picky, but I'm just picturing. No, the it's, it's not, I don't think it's picky and I don't think it's a problem. If you want, if you have a 200 foot rear yard, I think in this situation, you just can't count on the next house being 200 more feet farther away, but you still have a 200 foot rear yard. But you can, yes, you can have a rear yard um, that backs up to someone's side yard because that's how things work with corners. Um, and th though we haven't addressed it, the zoning would have to have rules right. about how you treat buildings on corners, um, whether they are considered to have two fronts um, or if there's a primary Right. What, what, I'm, what I'm talking about is a situation where you have two properties back to back. This, prop, this property has an existing house somewhere, and it is protected by a 200 foot, two or 300 foot rear yard because the road is out there from this property. But then this property runs a road right in, and all of a sudden, the back of this property can have a house 20 feet away from what used to be required at two or 300 feet. Yeah. Yes, yes, that is possible. And is there any way to protect against that? Which would lead to another question I have, if you want to allow me that time. Uh, I think we should move on and come back to you and make sure okay. that everyone gets enough time to chat. Um, so Toby next, and then Sarah. Uh, would there, I mean, this is maybe ahead of the game, but if these were set, would there be uh, an option for an individual a lot owner to change their uh, designation via zoning variance? Um, so the, a couple of things there. So you can, someone can always petition to change the zoning on their lot. That is something that would go to the town board. The town board decides what the zone is for each lot. So there is a process in the existing zoning to request a rezoning and that would also be the case in any um, future adopted zoning. 
So that's one thing that someone could do if the parameters of the zone their lot is in didn't work for them. They could request to be in a different lot. Um, the other thing that they could do that you touched on is they could ask for a variance from any one of these parameters. So um, if there was some particular reason that the layout of your lot made meeting one of these things difficult, um, that is what the BZA is there for, because zoning is always somewhat general. There's always special circumstances um, that apply to any particular lot. So the ability to go to the, to the BZA and ask for a variance and have the reasons for it reviewed um, is constitutionally guaranteed, essentially. Sarah. <clears throat> Hey, um, so I, was, I had a question about the high priority preservation zone. So we've, we've talked about it being just like kind of a baseline now, and then people can add into that. Is that something that could happen after the fact? Like, are we going to have a process for people to be added into that? And it, is that something that needs to get voted on every time? Or like, what would that process look like? Because I have a feeling there's going to be a lot of people who don't know about it. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, we're trying to reach out to people, but yeah. Good point. So, um, I think that it makes the most sense. To, I, I'm not sure that there's a legal precedent for not having that be something that would go through the normal rezoning process. That the town board, someone would apply, the town board would would accept the change. Um, I think it would not be very contentious to put some interesting idea in there. Um, I don't know if there's an easier way that we could make it um, simpler to apply and uh, not require that process. Um, I think pretty much. I think it pretty much has to be that that way. Um, but yes, they could certainly could do it going forward, and we could continue advertising that possibility. Um, I do always want to make sure that people understand that it is far stronger to put a property in a conservation easement if you want to protect the property long term. Putting your property in this zone is great, um, but as soon as a, a different town board comes along or a future owner petitions the town board, someone can change their the zoning on the lot again in the future. Eas maybe not easily, but um, it's certainly possible. So if you really want to protect the future of the land that you have stewarded, a conservation easement is a much better way to do it. Um, but there is this zoning possibility as well. Um, I'm going to go to uh, Rhonda and then Corbett and then Leslie. Okay, so I have a very specific question that refers to the rural character zones. I have been lucky all these 44 years to have had no one build across the road from me in this beautiful forest. And the reason for that is that as soon as you cross the road, it goes up a steep slope. Uh, and in current with current setbacks the front setback is 50 feet so there would be no way that anybody could put a house uh, in that space there uh, because of the steep slope but according to the setbacks that you have now uh, that you're proposing here these uh, small small parcels of uh, two acres or less and 10 to 20 feet front setback, I could envision three houses in a row going on this, right in this forest before it goes up the steep slope. And I can imagine with somebody being so close to me, I mean, literally right across, right across the road, I could imagine the value of my house absolutely taking a huge dive. And I want your comments on that. Uh, so it would be possible for someone to, um, under the zoning, have the same two acre lot that they could have under the existing zoning. And yes, the front yards are more flexible. Um, 
I have never seen someone's house value plummet because someone built a house across the street from them. I don't think that that is a likely scenario. In fact, it's more likely the opposite. Um, but, uh, but yes, um, allowing a 20 foot front yard instead of a 50 foot front yard would make it possible in some situations to put a house in a location that it wouldn't fit otherwise. Um, Although it's worth remarking that, you know, that the, that constitutes a practical difficulty, which is grounds for a variance. Yep. So someone certainly could um, pursue a variance under the current zone and they could divide the entire parcel up into um, smaller pieces than they would, twice as many pieces as they would be allowed current um, under the future zoning if they follow the current rules. So I would be opposed to that. I think that that kind of frontage is, um, I, I think it's really intrusive, especially mm. for somebody who's already here. Why was I required in this particular zone to have 50 feet uh, minimum frontage when now these people are going to be allowed to have 10 to 20 feet? That uh, Rhonda, I don't think your house has 50 feet of frontage. It does. In fact, it's almost 60. So I, I think you've um, made it clear you disagree with this uh, front yard being less. We've talked about reasons why it would be less. Um, and we can move on to the next comment, which was Corbett. Yeah, um, mine's the, um, a more general question. Um, Thank you. When you look at the map, oops, sorry, I just have it up on another screen. Um, we're looking at the town of Danby, but we're looking at things like um, the high priority preservation land, most of which I believe is state forest. Right. Is that correct? The high priority preservation zone is all either state forest, town owned, or Finger Lakes um, land, land trust. trust owned. Okay. So, um, or other state, you know, New York state owned. Right. Owned. So, um, it might be helpful at some point to look at a buffer around the town into the other towns just to get, um, like for example, the um, conservation corridors, or the habitat corridors, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure that that relates to contiguous land in other towns. And I, th I just think it might be interesting to have a look at that. In terms of the zoning in the yeah, adjacent um, towns? In terms of specifically where we might want to, to consider moving um, rural character one into um, a more, you know, into high priority. Okay, uh, I, I wanna let you know that so far the consensus of the group has been um, that we created the high priority preservation zone as a 25 acre minimum and that we weren't willing to um, put that on anyone um, without their consent, basically. Ah, that, okay. Well, then we can almost, you can almost call that an already preserved zone. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. at, at which point, um, I, for example, one I could apply priority. to it. I, but I, I would, I, we've talked about this a lot. My husband and I have talked about this. And <laughs> Um, you know, we're probably going to get a conservation easement. There's a, a bunch of different things, uh, but applying to be part of a high priority preservation with state land around us um, might be an, a, a good option also. Sure. Um, yeah, like I said earlier, the conservation easement is much more protective. Right. Um, oh, yeah. And we're, yeah. we're, kind of, we're kind of planning to go even further than that. Yeah. And, it, and really, if your lot is 20 acres or smaller, there isn't a lot of 
it doesn't really make a difference if you put it in the high priority preservation because it already can't be subdivided under the rural character one, um, unless we make other differences between those. That's a good point, thank you. Yep. Uh, I'm trying to remember who was next. I think it was Leslie. You're seeing more hands raised than I am. Okay, I don't, tell me if this isn't general enough, I'm sorry. <laughs> I found, I found um, the clusters of historic farm resources map uh -huh. um, from a while ago, um, and 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 uh, it, it, I'm only looking at the highest priority areas on that map, and almost all of them are we've got in the rural character two. Um, mm -hmm. I'd like to see. You know, and I can share you, with you the map and stuff. I'd like to see some of those moved into the rural character one. I mean, it's um, you know, I look, I look at, I look at Comfort Road that's mostly in rural character one in the northern part of Comfort. I think that's Comfort Road, right? Um, mm -hmm. And look at all those houses in there. I mean, there's like clusters, you know, tons of houses in there. Where, where, and and most of that, there's one little section on this that's in the highest priority um, farm resources. But if you if you look at Nelson Road, there aren't that many the houses, and it's all it's mostly in rural character two. All all of it, all the upland field property, is mm -hmm. all in. in uh, real character two, and on this map, it almost all of Nelson Road is in highest priority. Um, you know, this was in 2001 that this map was done, and and there were all farm fields and um, uh, you know upland bird habitat. Um, mm -hmm. But I, I, you know, so I'd like a, I'd like somewhere down the road to be compare, you know, at least like comparing the Comfort Road area with that Nelson Road. Um, and I'd like to see some of that rural character two turned into a rural character one. <laughs> um, there's also a huge section of Miller Road that that is all farm fields. I mean, it's right. been farmed forever. Miller and Troy Road area. Um, it's none of that's in rural character one. None of it. Um, That's right. And um, yeah. just just before you go on. Um, uh -huh. I won't go on. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, part of the, the reason for that in, in the evolution of our conversation, uh -huh. um, where rural character two came from was really the kind of the working lands concept. So places where we wouldn't mm -hmm. want to make it difficult for agricultural operators to keep their, their um, operations productive. Um, and rural character one was more of the kind of the UNAs and the steep slopes and the, the places where we did want to add a lot of extra. Um, but that's not comfort road. Review. I mean, um, so the so northern part, not anyway. I, th I yeah. think that's that's something conceptually that I hope we can talk more about is yeah. the main difference between these those two is site plan review for a right. lot more stuff in the rural character one. They're both the same lot sizes. Right, um, right. It's a, it's a site plan review I'm after. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, the site plan review and then also the amount of development rights that you can transfer. Right. So maybe we can we can talk more when we get to the map about yeah. making some specific changes. Okay. That, that's the concept. Okay. So uh, is this yeah, I almost would have I almost would have suggested that we go column by column uh, to you know with respect to the zones and see whether we we actually agree on 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 the parameters. Yeah, I think we can do that after we get kind of us general questions. Um, okay. So I'd like to go next to Lynn and um, then we can go back to Ted. 
Okay, you, yes, you tried to explain the uh, small front yard setback, but they didn't really understand or accept the explanation. I agree that uh, 10 or 20 feet front setback is pretty small. In fact, if you go down to the uh, review parameters below, it talks about uh, development should be hidden or screened from the road. And you can't really screen something from the road if it's only 10 feet away. Um, so I, I think uh, that's backwards. Uh, I'm not sure. Um, yeah, again, I don't understand it. And I, uh, you know what? what? There's, 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 there's another consideration here, which is that one almost would say a screen from the existing roads, because I think that these uh, yards are, are intended to address, if you create a new road, uh, allowing clustering you know, with sort of the normal situation where you wouldn't necessarily want the houses spread all over the place. Is that correct, David, or? Uh, no, I was, I was including existing roads. Um, and, you know, I, I, I understand, and it's up for, for this group to decide if you want the, us to go to bigger lots with bigger front yards. Um, that, you know, that, that's a decision for the community to make. I do think that um, there is a historic precedent, especially in working farms, for some of those buildings being right on the road. Yeah. Um, uh, a lot of those roads were not, you know, as busy as they are today when those buildings were put there, but that is a common um, working land uh, feature of having the barns and the, the farmhouse right at the road, um, which is why I left the bigger front yard in the suburban area, because that's really a suburban thing. It's about uh, being it far away from your neighbors and privacy, whereas um, the other zones are intended to be um, more of a rural or, or working land type feature and less of the suburban neighborhood. And, uh, but it, it's really up to this group. It doesn't matter what I think. Um, and can you explain the, the new cluster setback from existing homes? Yes. Lots. I didn't, is that all homes or what do you, what's the new cluster part of that? So part of um, the way we're doing this, it's called density averaging of, we're requiring, you know, you get one residential lot per 10 acres, but those lots can be relatively small, um, is we want to encourage someone if they're gonna, you know, develop their lot that they develop it with small lots that are clustered close together on one part of their lot. And then the rest of the lot um, can be kept as forest or field. Um, or other things. Um, so how does that apply to existing lots? So those clusters, there was concerns from people that, you know, uh, if we allow these clusters of small houses, um, they like that idea generally, but just not next to them. Um, so if you were going to do this um, and uh, say you had a hundred acre lot and you wanted to get the maximum you could subdivide out of it, you could have you know, nine, um, one and a half or two acre lots um, and you would put them all as close to each other as you could, um, but then you would situate them so they were far as far away from the neighbor's house as possible. Um, but that they, only applies to clusters, not to individual structures? Yes. Okay. Uh, so we were going to go to back to Ted, and then I see Kim, Catherine, and Rhonda. Okay. Um, I have a number of closely related questions about column G, the cluster setback. Uh, the first one is what I dropped into the, um, into the chat. In the case where Rhonda, that Rhonda was describing, would the cluster setback or, or the, the setback from her existing home protect her? Um, it wouldn't protect her from a single lot, but yeah, if someone was going to do a cluster across from her, it depending on what zone she's in the, uh, they would be in the rural character one zone. So yeah, the cluster would have to be 600 feet from her home. Right, right. So you've sort of answered my second question. Uh, 
I, I thought that we were originally talking about a setback from, which applied to any house from any house unless it was within the subdivision of a single lot which created a cluster. Those could be close together. So has that changed? In other words, if someone has an existing lot with an existing house and someone else wants to build a house on the next lot over, does that setback apply, even though there's no subdivision? No. And what I proposed it did. Well, yes, that's what that was what I'm what I'm saying. When you proposed it, that's what it did. And I'm wondering how, how it changed and why. And while I'm at it, um, let me just get the other one in there. Um, when you have properties adjacent properties. Um, I'm, sure, I'm thinking mostly about the cluster, but I, I imagine you could apply it to some other things as well if, if they were appropriate. Should the restrictions of the more restrictive, more restricted parcel apply to its neighbors? In other words, if you've got a, uh, oh, your rural two, which has its uh, 600 foot uh, cluster setback, Mm -hmm. Shouldn't it apply to the immediate neighbor? They, otherwise, right. you're disadvantaging everybody who's in a rural too. The idea here is not, I'm not looking at this from the point of view of what is permitted, but from the point of view of what, how are we protecting existing homes and properties, which is part of the problem with our existing um, zoning is that we're not protecting, we're not, and it leads to issues all the time. Yeah, so I think there's an important point to be really clear about there, which is that um, this uh, new cluster setback does something that's generally not a part of zoning. Um, there really isn't an, I was here first, I now have more rights than you um, outlook to zoning. So just because everyone should be allowed to do the same level of development in the same zone. And the fact that you know, one house comes after another, generally, especially if it's just a single house, you should have the same rules that the person next to you had. And the fact that their lot was there before yours doesn't give them any special priority to, to decide how your house should be laid out. Um, I think it's a slightly different situation when we're talking about a, a cluster. It's really a, a mini neighborhood that has um, some more impact than one person having uh, a house next to an existing house. Um, right. But someone who bought a house on an acre and a half of land that was surrounded by parcels that were 20 acres doesn't have a reasonable expectation that those lots that they don't own, that they're not willing to buy, are maintained in that state in perpetuity. That's, that's all they, fair enough. I, yeah. I, I can even agree with you. But do remember that partly by human nature and partly by our, the way our existing zoning has worked, we have a large number of narrow and very, very long parcels. And the way this zoning map was set up um, they're generally zoned based, based on what's by the road, not what's at, in the back lot, not what's mm -hmm. in the back acres. And the conditions are very different. And what you're, when you, you could be setting up a situation where something that is zoned in, of, in one way because it's of its road frontage applies that relaxed or restricted for that matter, but I'm really concerned about the relaxed. Uh, it applies the relaxed zoning thousands of feet from where, from the location that dri drove the classification. That was my reason for him being concerned about the, about the, the, the depth of the, of the zoning when you, when you go by lot. Uh, an awful lot of undeveloped back acreage is included in the same rules as the frontage. That he, Joel has said it in so many fewer words than I did. Um, 
and that's absolutely yeah. true. So we, that has pretty much been edited out of most of the suburban neighborhood zone. And there isn't really a significant um, well difference there in the other two zones. Right. Frankly, my concern is about the rural one and rural two areas. Uh -huh. <laughs> the suburban, they are what they are. Um, so, so what is your concern, Ted, that the uh, rear yard behind a 10 acre lot would be 200 instead of 300 feet? Well, you're talking rear yard. I was really talking the cluster setback. Um, but th okay. this is it. I'm, I think I'm, we, we had talked about with the cluster setback only 300 feet, but I suggested um, a gradation where it would be a little mm -hmm. less in the suburban neighborhood and a little more in yeah. the rural one. So we're, right. we're actually talking about double what we had talked about previously in the rural one. Right. And the uh, same that we talked about before in the rural two. Are you right. feeling? Um, I mean, I, I, there are many examples of this, but I'm just going to talk with the one about, mention the one that you know, I'm most familiar with. Um, on Gunderman Road, there are several properties that are literally thousands of feet long and they're classified in rural one. They are not 10 acre parcels. They're, they're, they're potential targets for, for significant uh, subdivisions, big ones. And they're classified rural one because of the dent, I, I believe you can tell me I'm wrong, because of the density of what exists now on Gunderman Road, but the back acres are a completely different story. And I'm sure that occurs elsewhere. Uh, <laughs> Nelson strikes me as one place where that could happen. Um, so oh boy, just, just, just to be clear, just to be clear, Ted, the, the rural one versus rural two doesn't have anything to do with the density along the street. It has to do with the environmental characteristics. So those lots on Gunderman are flatter than the lots that are in rural one that um, are behind them. So that's the, the difference there. Um, but I, I think we're kind of talking past each other because I'm not really seeing what it is that you're concerned about um, under rural two development. What could happen? You're, you're muted, but what could happen with that zoning that would be a problem? You're still muted. You're still muted. What I'm concerned about is that someone could take a very long property which extends a rural one property, for example, which extends right down to a rural two or a rural two, which extends right down to a high uh, impact area mm -hmm. and develop the back end of it as if it was the front end, which would very much change the character of the higher protection property. Okay, we'll come back to it um, so we can get some other people in, but I, okay, I'm just not back. seeing um, because the development density that we're talking about is less than half what's currently allowed, I'm, I'm not really seeing um, how there's anything that would result in a significant impact to character to a neighboring parcel. Well, I, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not always a fan of comparing it to what's currently allowed now. I'm looking at it for its own sake and what the rules would allow. All right, why don't we go to Kim and then Catherine and then Rhonda. Yeah, I'm, I'm looking at the rural character one and two with those, the front yard. And I, I don't, I mean, that's about what we've got for the hamlet, isn't it? What we were talking about in the hamlet meeting for how far away from the road. Mm -hmm. But on yeah. a much, much bigger parcel. I know, but um, one of the things in all of these meetings for months that we've been talking about is that we really don't want to be developing along the road. Um, so if it's 10 feet from the road or even 20 feet from the road, to me, that's, I mean, the, the ditch is going to be about eight to 10 feet. So then you're like building in the ditch practically. And then if you've got a truck going by, it's going to shake the whole house. I, I just don't really get yeah. that that is, um, that that's accomplishing what we're trying to do. You know, I mean, that was a big mm -hmm. thing to try to not, 
Can, can, I, can I interrupt you for a second, Kim? Uh, sure. Just so that I can clarify that we're on the same the same page. The front yard number isn't where someone is required to build. It's where someone is not allowed to build. So if someone didn't want to have their house near a street where a truck rumbled by, they can certainly put the buildings farther back. Um, there's nothing that prevents that. It just allows in circumstances where someone wanted it for them to put their building closer. Um, well, it just seems like it's more um, more extreme than what we even have now or more um, that, that it would encourage more roadside. We, we had talked about the possibility and there's somewhere down on um, uh, row 14, hidden or screened from the road and neighboring properties when possible. That, that to me makes sense, but um, yeah, I just, I, I don't really get it. Um, I'm sorry, <laughs> I'm no, not trying to be critical. Awesome. I'm just trying to see how we're accomplishing our objectives by doing that. Pardon me for interrupting, but it, it probably is worth understanding that from the road means from the road right of way, which is often what 33 feet from the center line. Well, it depends which, on the, it depends on what road you're talking um, about because the, the right of way is not a fixed width on user roads. Depend depends on the road. That is correct, but we're not. In, in other words, you're not being allowed to build in the ditch. It's probably the right of way includes the ditch. That's correct. That's that's the, the it's it certainly includes the ditch. So it's going to be from the back side of the ditch that you're going to be measuring, if there is one. Yeah. Can I chime in real quick? Who is that, Sarah? Yeah. Um. Yeah. I've got Catherine and Rhonda waiting, but if you want to jump in with something related, real quick. Just on this topic, yeah. Um. I think there's two schools of thought for whether or not to build on the road and whether or not to hide it away, ecologically speaking, or even like if you want to have a farm, you're going to want to have your house or whatever buildings closer to the edge so you have more farmable land or you can preserve more open space for animals and things like that. So there's two different ways of thinking about it. I don't think everyone here is on the same page with that, but that is kind of the idea with that. From how I see it, you want to be able to let people in rural areas be able to put their house kind of in the corner so they can use the rest of it for potential farming or whatever else, just leave the rest be how it is. That was it. Plus so we're, we're, we're talking too about having site plan review. So that's where those other things come into play. Um, so why don't we go to Catherine and then Rhonda. Thank you. Um, that was the one thing I've been waiting to say is site plan review is the big part of this. And I love what Sarah said. So with um, the, my question with the site plan review that might be helpful and I don't have the answers are if we had some parameters that might help us understand what site plan could include. You know, I think site plan review is pretty cool, but I don't know what the parameters are. That's it. Thanks, Catherine. Uh, Rhonda, I'm gonna address what Catherine said and then- Maybe you didn't hear me. Uh oh. No, I heard you. You're, you've got a little- um, a bad Buffering thing. issue. Yeah. But I think I, I heard and understand what you asked. Um, so I just want to address what can be covered in site plan review. Um, and one of the things that I've done here is specifically list the things that the planning board would consider when looking at site, a site plan review outside of a hamlet. It's important that the town um, is clear and that uh, a landowner can have some uh, clarity and assurance about what is involved in site plan review and how they can bring a design to the table that will um, pass in site plan review. Site plan review cannot be a do, do the neighbors like it or does the planning board like it. Um, that is called being arbitrary and capricious and it's when the town ends up spending a lot of legal dollars 
um, on a process. Site plan review has to have clear parameters of what is expected, um, what is allowed. Uh, and, and that's why I've set out this list. Um, there are other things that are considered in other places. I think we wanna be careful to be considering the things that are important in the zones where we're requiring site plan review and be clear about what the purpose is. Um, you know, it's not about enforcing a certain lifestyle. It's not about a certain um, uh, type of, you know, style of building. It's really about these, um, the character and impacts on the community and on the environment uh, is what I've tried to keep it focused on. Uh, Rhonda. Okay, so my comment, I, I, first of all, let me say that in this particular case, my comment deals with South Danby. Now, South Danby is a hamlet, and it actually has an existing church. It's now a house, but it was a church at one time. It has an existing school, which is now a house, and it has an existing uh, basement of the general store and post office, which um, is now a house. So we actually, and there is a history for this area of Danby called South Danby. And the road is called South Danby Road. So um, I, I want to make sure that everybody understands that back in the early 70s, there were very few houses in existence in South Danby. And they owned, those houses owned most of the property in, or a good portion of the property in South Danby. And then in the late 70s, those parcels started to get split up. And a lot of the building that took place in South Danby took place in the late 70s and early 80s and was all basically under the zoning of that time, which was 50 foot set back from the road, from the road at the time, and uh, 25 foot setback on the sides. Now most, so that means most of the houses in South Danby are either set back that way or even further that you, you would be hard pressed to find a house that is closer to the road than that. Even except for the, the church and the one room schoolhouse, which are closer but most of the houses are 50 feet. I feel that we ought to maybe be thinking about drawing a shape that actually defines more completely South Danby and that the rural character of South Danby be maintained. That means that we continue this business of at least 50 feet setback and 20 foot sidebacks. Uh, having next to me, I, when I bought my house, there was no agricultural district, an ag district around me on all four sides, and there is now. And I'm sorry that I don't have more of a setback on the sides than I already do. So setbacks on the side can be very important. The other thing I want to say is that the person who now owns the land across the road from me, I am certain, and knowing him well, uh, I am certain he would like to make as much money out of this property as he possibly could. And if he knew that he only had a 10 foot setback, and I know exactly where that setback would be because he and I were disputing the position of a utility pole the other day and I got out the tape measure and measured it from the center line. So I know where that utility pole is. And that utility pole, it would be five feet back from the, not from the center of the road, but from the edge of the right of way. And 
he would jump at the chance to put in three houses in a row right in front of me and right in my view. And I, I'm certain that it would affect the value of my house for sure. Uh, I would be living in someone's living room basically. So I would like to suggest, and I'm glad Corbett is here and would like her to chime in on this, but I would like to define South Danby and make a, a rural character dash dash South Danby or call it number three, whatever you want to do. But I want to make it specific to South Danby so that we can maintain the rural character that at least has been established by the current building and not have a lot of people building in a way that I think most of the people in South Danby would not approve of. Okay, I'd like to chime in because I, I can't raise my hand as a co-host, it seems. The, the, um, I still have a problem with the suburban neighborhood. I was talking to Pat Woodworth this afternoon about this and she suggested what the, the suburban uh, is really inconsistent with what we what we think of as, as even the developed parts of Danby and suggested renaming it um, uh, not rural character but but uh, low density residential which is what it's currently zoned uh, because it really is a low density residential even at at, uh, at the five acres and and I had suggested and I and I and I would st still like to see it that that in that low density residential zone and currently labeled suburban neighborhood, that there still be one residential unit for five acres. And that to get to the two, you'd have to buy it in rather than have it be by right. Is that your whole comment? Yeah, well, I, I, again, I'm going to come back to the suggest, uh, suggestion I made earlier that when you when you get to general comments. I think it would be good to go column by column here uh, and, and, and uh, you know, have questions specifically about, you know, are these the zones we really want? Does, 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 it, does, it, does, it, does it cover the, 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 the realm of possibilities? Uh, mm -hmm. And then, you know, column by column about the characteristics of each one to see whether that reflects the, the group um, support, I guess I would say. Yeah, I think we can do that. I think we should be uh, have some clarity about how we're going to decide um, as a group if things should change. Um, do we want to have a vote of everyone who's here um, to make changes from a proposal? Do we want to just continue giving me a general sense of how everyone feels um, and uh, and then I'll make changes for the next meeting and we'll see how that goes. Um, we may have, well, at, at some point it will come to a need to, to, uh, to, to have some votes, I'm afraid, because we, we, we are, as, as Sarah pointed out earlier, still divided on the, you know, close to the road versus back from the road, uh, the feeling for trying to preserve rural, rural character as mm -hmm. opposed to valuing the environmental protection and uh, fragmentation more highly. So that's not, I mean, we've sort of addressed it. Uh, I mean, at least at least we've reduced the, the potential by dropping the density and by adding site plan review. But, um, you know, there's still, there's still that, 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 that basic issue at, at, at play nonetheless. And we can only minimize it just so much, but. Mm -hmm. Um, per perhaps what we should do is really clarify where there is um, where there's a split in the group where something is you know kind of 50 50 and where um, we can ask for the kind of general sense of the group if someone says something and most people disagree with it then we don't need to spend a lot more time on it but if there's a significant split maybe we'll just wait um, wait for the for a future meeting and you know come up with some alternate proposals to do something more formal like voting. I think that's a good idea. Okay. Let's see. Uh, just, just to 
to close up Rhonda, in the question of Rhonda's concern, she described a case where her neighbor across the street would want to divide off three houses, uh, three three lots. Mm -hmm. Under the new new scheme proposed, would that not basically be a, a cluster, and would she be protected by the cluster setback? Yes, I think if someone was doing three small lots next to each other, that would be a cluster. Even if they're on the road? Yeah. And so site plan review would kick in, right? And it's near a stream and some pretty vulnerable areas downhill from there. I would think that would get knocked out because of that. Yeah, in the rural character one, there's site plan review for all new buildings. Right. Well, so I just want to say that, excuse me, Ted, I just want to say that my neighbor, Jennifer Tiffany, is the, first, the next house to the north of me. And she was allowed to split off a parcel from her 80 acres and build a house on it. She built the house on it. And no one contacted me or asked me if I, what I thought about that and how I felt it might affect the stream or anything like that. So I don't really trust the town to get in contact with me about something that someone wants to do. In fact, the opposite tends to be the case. Well, your neighbor is planning to do something and it's absolutely none of your business that they want to do this on their land. And it's, I don't like yeah. that attitude. It it affects me. It may affect all kinds of things. It may affect the water that I pump out of my well, for all I know. I mean, because my well is in the front yard. So, you know, I am definitely concerned about this. I think we need a new tactic if we're going to have site plan review. We need to be contacting people. And, you know, this has been brought up before in town board meetings about the fact that and Olivia was the one who originally complained about it. And I remember the meeting and I chimed in and said, yes, I agree. We should extend the uh, amount of notification to more than 500 feet. Because after all, if somebody lives 600 feet from you, the next house down the road, then you're not going to be notified about anything that happens <laughs> to the next house down the road. So we have to start expanding this whole concept of who's going to be notified and how. And it was just by odd chance that I saw a sign that Steve Courtright had put up on a parcel uh, on South Danby Road about it being subdivided and all of this sort of thing. If I hadn't, see, if he hadn't put the sign up as he ha had, then I wouldn't have seen the sign. Yeah, I, I and, raise your hand. Rhonda, I think that's enough. Because yeah, well, we're way point, off topic. We're, we're not, we're not entirely off topic, but the, yes. the yeah. point that Rhonda is making is that, you know, we, we ought to have well, first of all, site plan review will be a part of what we come up with, and, and we're getting into the weeds a little bit on, on uh, you know, what notification requirements are going to be associated with it. So I think that's sort of down the road a ways, but um, the fact that site plan review will help address these kinds of concerns, I think, is, is somewhat reassuring. And it's not it's not the whole picture yet, but I think we ought to we ought to we ought to hold off on on the on the fine points of refinement until we until we get the basic parameters in position. Hey Joel, the, the the current way is that everyone within a certain number of feet of your property line gets a mailing, and then there is a sign put out on the road that goes both directions for a certain number of days. I think it's like ten or whatever right. knows right. the number of days. So yeah. people do have the opportunity to see, maybe not as much as they would want, but. There Maybe is, we'll yeah. adjust it, but when you know, and but but I think that that's you know we, we have that now. We probably want to do over time. We've been more and more <clears throat> aware of the value of notifying people sooner rather than later in whatever process. And I can't see us backing away from that. I can only see it getting more moving in a direction of more notification rather than less. Yeah, I, I want to acknowledge I see um, Ivan and Nancy have hands up and I also um, just before we get off of the notification and site plan review train, 
Um, I think it's really important to be clear that those processes are not do neighbors have complaints. Um, right. Neighbors not liking something does not make that something not allowed on someone's parcel. It's a process to be, it's a chance to come and be involved in uh, making sure that the review of the uh, requirements is done fairly, um, but no one has a right to not have a house built on their neighbor's property or to not see someone who develops in a way that is allowed. Um, the, the, the process um, doesn't privilege current owners over future owners in that way. It's only a chance to make sure that uh, a proposal follows the existing rules and parameters. Well, I mean, uh, the main right. value in involving your neighbors is that the neighbors know the property and, and the surrounding properties and can contribute to the site plan review process. Yeah. Right. Um, so I want to go to Ivan and then to Nancy. Did we lose Ivan? Maybe we lost Ivan or you're muted, Ivan. We may have stepped away. We'll go to Nancy. And then Lynn, are you coming? Nope. Yes. It is I'm unmuted. Yep. Yep. Okay. okay hi. So I'm a little confused because well, about a couple things, kind of, kind of basic, like I keep hearing this term rural character talked about, but I don't know that it's been defined. And, and the reason one of my, I'm confused about it is because from my perspective, they've been building houses right on the road in rural areas. So historically, I mean, that's how houses and tracts of land were um, figured out. So, and then you say you don't want to see the houses, but then you're saying they can be 10 foot from the road. And so I don't, I'm confused. I think this really needs to be, um, instead of giving reasons why it could be on the road or not on the road, like, what do we really want? You know, do we want them on the road or not? And if we don't want them on the road, then don't call it rural character. You know, I just, or, or define rural character somehow because it's a very vague term. So, and I have a lot of, and I like, but I did want to say also just quickly, I'd like to see that talked about just briefly if whatever, but also David, I think you had a really good idea to kind of break down some of these ideas and uh, see where, and take a poll. Like, do people like development units? Do they like buying them? Do they like selling them? Do they like the breakdowns? because um, I think they're gonna find that's where your real discussions will be in those, those uh, when we you know, put this out to other people, maybe to listserv, maybe by our meeting next week, we'll really know what topics are very, you know, where there's disagreement and where we need to work, do the work. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Nancy. Before we go on to Ted, whose hand is up, I do want to point out that this group, I think, spent the first six months talking about or arguing rural about, character, right. <laughs> disagreeing about what is rural character. Um, so there are differing opinions. Um, I think what most people mean is they like it the way it is. Um, but with that said, um, Ted does have his hand up. Um, yeah, it's, it, it's just a reaction to something you said earlier. I think you're absolutely correct, and we all, should all very strongly bear in mind that the process of subdivision site review and all the rest of it does not protect the rights of, of, of neighboring landowners. It's not intended to. That David was very clear about that and I think he's right. It is the rules and the details that we're discussing now, you know, whether the numbers that we're looking at on the screen right now or Detail, little details, whether it has to be a cluster to get a setback from an existing rural uh, home or not. Those are what can be written in a way that we feel can best protect everyone equally. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Ivan. Oh, sorry, I was muted. Um, I am interested in just taking a slightly different turn. I think you know, one of the reasons I moved here and I really love this place is the 
current openness and amount of green space and everything here. But I also agree that to some extent, developing a more dense hamlet and then figuring out ways to enable some development but protect the character of the existing uh, out, greater outlying Danby is, is really important. Um, I think one thing that might be worth talking about, or maybe it's part of the Hamlet group more, is uh, as these changes happen, if, if people with large plots uh, transfer development rights, some areas are going to have some very, could have some very dense subdivisions or sub uh, developments pop up. Um, and in addition to the benefit to the current landowners, wherever those end up, not anything in specific, you know, the people coming in, it's going to bring more people to the area, more use and driving on the roads, more uh, demand for uh, other services provided by the town and things like that. And I wonder if that is worth considering as a, un, you know, way to, to, or a thing to talk about if there's a importance in making sure that as those current owners greatly benefit in a financial sense and new people come in and densify, are they going to also help share uh, the additional cost and tax burden that more development brings? Um, and that's just a thought I had. It's not anything in particular, any particular spot, just a larger concept. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think that is an important consideration, how development impacts um, the, the tax base. And I think that's why we want it to be as clustered as possible, because it's more it's easier to provide services whether the service is road or fire or whatever it is um, to lots that are closer together and more clustered um, it's a it's actually a really good argument against allowing any new roads um, to be honest because most new roads uh, don't have the density required to pay for them and all of our existing roads don't have the density required to pay for them so as much uh, new density we can get on existing roads is really the better from a tax perspective. Um, Nancy, you have your hand up. Yeah, hi. So I, I, got, I, I wanna respond to your answer about the world, definition of rural character. There's some people like me who've only been coming to meetings the last couple few weeks or whatever. So maybe we should have a mission, like something like a mission statement of what rural character is. So when you go to the public and talk to people, we have a common knowledge of what we, we mean by that. Is that a possibility? I, I don't think that there's a chance to um, work out a mission statement at this point in the process. What we do have is the comprehensive plan, um, which I think does a good job of laying out um, the, the current character of the town and the things that should be protected and the ways we want to protect them. You know, it, it really comes down to uh, having open spaces, having parts of the town that are not developed, um, having places to farm and to have habitat and to have forests. Um, those are all the pieces. And then we have to work out the specifics um, in this context. Um, I, what it I came down to, Nancy, was that, that um, rural is not suburban. And the, the, the definition um, actually, it was Rhonda who, who suggested we use one that, that I think was the DEC's definition. It basically hinges on the, the largely undeveloped character of the land. Um, and largely undeveloped means you, you, you don't have that many houses on, on it. You, you talked about earlier that the, the historical development pattern was to have the houses close to the road. True. Um, except that the only places that you had very many houses along that road was in the hamlets. And any place that had a cluster of houses um, almost had a, a place name associated with it. That's why we had we had Stratton and we had West Danby and we had North Danby and Central Danby and South Danby. Um, anywhere there was a cluster of a few houses, it was a it was a hamlet. And then in between, there were farms with houses widely spaced, close to the road, but widely spaced. But when you start filling them in between, you know, the and 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 you lose that that. Uh, sense of a clustered development area, then uh, it, it, it transitions to more of a suburban character. Yeah, it, it's really a, in a large part about density. Um, so Joel, I, I want to think about um, where we're at with time. Yeah. And I, I think it would be a good idea to go through 
uh, as you suggested, column by column and decide uh, with the group where there is contention that we should come back to in the next meeting because um, we're not we're not going to resolve it tonight no no but we can it would be nice to see where we agree and where we when, where we need to work more yeah. um, so with with that in mind um, I'd like us to focus and maybe go uh, a column at a time and we can start right with zone so these are the four zones that came out of, I think, at least three meetings of this group working towards um, what zones we want and what they do. Um, are, is the group comfortable or does the group want to have further discussion about what the zones are uh, or are we comfortable with these zones being the zones? We will open it up for discussion on that. There's a comment in the chat to get rid of character and just have rural, rural two, rural one. Sure. Which is essentially what we've done, yeah. yeah. Well, take the character out. I see. It'll That's avoid the, the confusion with the term rural character when you just call it rural one and rural two. Sure. Then we won't even have to have that discussion because it means different things to everybody and we're never going to be able to come up with a de definition we all agree on with that. Yeah, I'd, like to get, I'd like to get rid of suburban in the first one. <laughs> oh, I would. I was going to say get rid of neighborhood. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I think yeah. suburban is actually pretty fitting. Yeah, I was suggesting just the word residential instead of suburban, as opposed to the hamlet, which is much more dense. I would suggest keeping the name that is already there because it's existing low density residential. Just call it again, exist a uh, uh, low density residential. That means the um, <clears throat> the things that have been in place for the last thirty years apply to that area, and that would make it easier to remember instead of having to tell everybody that's what it means. The catch is some of it is far from low density, and it would be a misnomer. Um, the it depends what you're used to. Compared to city, is low density. Yeah, it is low density compared to city, exactly. <clears throat> it's not high density. I mean, high density is a hamlet. Aren't we proposing to take these four things, suburban neighborhood, rural two, rural one, high priority, and those are taking the place of what we currently call existing LDR, so LDR won't really exist anymore. Correct. I do think it would be confusing to rename one zone, something we've already had. It would be confusing. I, I do think there's a point to if we are going to keep the zoning the same for that zone, which is what I've suggested. Um, it, it might help people understand that. But I don't really want to keep it the same. <laughs> well, maybe that will be our next question for the group if they disagree or agree. With yeah, that. yeah. Um, We're in the first column. We're in the first column. We are. Right, right, right. Well, um, I think we have some differences about whether to call it low density residential um i've got i saw two or three people um say didn't they don't like the word suburban either um we may perhaps need a different name for it what about just residential yeah low density doesn't fit if you're doing a two acre minimum low density doesn't suburban. fit there, and if you just write residential does it like if we're not talking about uses then that could also be confusing. Yes. Yeah. We all know what suburban is and two acre lots, that's suburban. All this boop, 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 right along the road, that's suburban. Yeah. Claire, are you thumbs, in, thumbs upping uh, residential? I was, yes. Okay. Um, but that wasn't why I had my hand up. Okay. Do you want to say something else about this yeah. uh, column? I'm still, I'm still a bit confused, um, particularly in view of some of the discussion we've had this evening as to what the difference between rural one and rural two is. I, mean, I can see that there are differences in what you can do there, but I'm not, it's not clear to me that we, that I anyway, have a good, good idea of what defines a rural one um, place versus a rural two. So could, well, 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 when we get to that, as we go column by column. 
But you're not. Um, in a way, but I, I think what Claire's getting at is why would a parcel be in one or two? Yes, yes. yes. Um, and the, that, that's those, exactly what I'm yeah. asking. And yeah. so I'm going to explain that real quickly and then we can move on. The why is the rural one has more environmentally sensitive characteristics. So if it had steep slopes on a significant part of the parcel, I put it in rural one instead of rural two. If it was in a UNA, I put it in rural one instead of rural two. If it was in one of the other kind of shapes that we had identified as important environmental characteristics, um, that's what made the difference. And then rural two was more places um, that didn't have those parameters or that were, you know, like working fields where um, we wouldn't, where we want those farms to keep operating. We want to do things in a way that it would not. So, get. so, so I hate to bring up where I live, but I live on the bit of comfort road that Leslie's dumping on. And so um, it's not that I necessarily um, know wh which of those two it should be in, but um, it, it's just not so clear to me that, um, that what you're saying is, is, is in fact how it, how it works out overall. Yeah. Yeah, I think I think the one parcel to another adjustments are something that we can make, and yeah, no, well, yes, I, yes, right. I made the initial assignments. Yeah. The initial yeah. assignments are from you know GIS data and my general look at it, and we'll we'll hone in on them. Um, but it sounds like with removing character from rural one and two, we're comfortable with all of the zones except there are some questions about what we call the suburban neighborhood zone. Yeah, um, I'd, I'd like to just open up the question before we go farther. Um, should there be a suburban neighborhood zone? Should there be a zone that is similar to the existing zoning? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, think. I mean, yeah, I don't like the existing zoning, so I'm not sure that I'm, I'm, I'm keen to have you know, more of what it was, what it did. Um, like you're saying that mostly the, the the properties that are in that in those areas that are yeah. pink basically are already uh, developed along the road frontage right. with those with those rules. But we're 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 about to change the rules, which would open up the back acreage in ways that are not are currently. Along the road. These aren't along the road. <laughs> well, it's based on the road frontage, basically. Not all of them are along the road. There's a number in the pink spots that are pretty far back. And well, that's exactly my that's exactly my point. Is that it, it isn't we have included in the pink a lot more than just you know 300 feet back from the road, which I wouldn't have any real problem with doing right. that. But by including all that back acreage with the same with the same one lot for uh, with basically two two units and five acres is a lot higher density than okay. one in ten. It's even uh, and it's it's. Slightly less than what is when we've got now, where we have this ridiculous formula that, 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 that you compute two ways. You know, it's, it's you're entitled to one lot for every 200 feet of frontage, or one lot for every every five acres, whichever gives you the bigger number. Yeah, Joel, I want to yeah. jump in, and it it sounds like what I just heard you say is that you actually are okay with a suburban zone if it were drawn differently, if it were only a certain distance from the road. Is that a fair um, translation? Yes. Okay. So I think we can we can look at drawing it um, differently um, as a different question. But if you're okay with there being some areas that keep the existing rules, I think we can. Would, would that mean the possibility of, of dividing a lot into two zones? Sure. I, I, that, that's yes, that's already have to. On, on a lot of lots. Yeah. Yeah. The southern side of Muzzy Road, where you have a number of fairly large, deep lots. Yeah, but we can talk about that uh, at a different. So the, the argument is, uh, or the question that you've posed, David, is, uh, do we want to have this zone? And the argument is essentially, do we want areas other than near the hamlet where there could be a fairly high density development, and in fact, some of it might, in certain kinds of land where the land is amenable to it, be away from the road. And th so my answer to that question, just is just personally you're asking everyone is, yes, we do. We, there, are, there are gonna be parts of Danby where thinking of the future of Danby, thinking of how people might, the, the pressure to move into areas like this over the next 50 years is definitely gonna go up. 
so we we want to be planning for areas where there could be a higher density development. Yeah, but it should yeah. be. We area. call it. <laughs> should we call it the community zone? Call it community. Sure, that's a nice word. That's a nice word. No, that doesn't mean. But they're all residential. So I th I think it's clear that we need more work on residential. a name there. But because yeah. we are approaching ten minutes from nine o'clock, I do. Mm -hmm want to make sure we get to the other columns. Um, yeah. So I, I think we'll plan on coming back to the question of what is the name of yeah. the lowest, the highest Whatever. density zone in what is currently yeah. the low density yeah. residential zone um, yeah. future. So the next yeah. column is the max average density for subdivisions before transfer of development rights. And I know that's a mouthful. Um, but are we generally comfortable with this set of max densities, um, which is a lot per five acres, a lot per 10 acres, and a lot per 25 acres divided up this way? No, don't, yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, I'd, I mean, the, the only one that speaks specifically of a lot is the, is the, is the, is the, is the first one, uh, as opposed to the with units per acre. Sure. Um, and I, and I just, I wondered whether we couldn't have it be one, one unit per five acres to that one rather than one lot. Why are you saying that, Joel? Lot size is specified, even though the word lot isn't used in the second column. Third column, you've got lot size. I'm not yeah, but, sure why you're saying. Well, I mean, I'm, I'm, I guess what I'm, what I'm, what I'm questioning is whether or not we, we should have that two acre minimum in there. I mean, that's part of it, but when I'm, I believe but the other part of it is if you're if you're if you're if you've got a five acre per unit, uh, that gives you a lower overall density than 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 the, than, than one lot for for for, for with two residences on it. But basically, it's a question of whether it's half the density if you do it one unit per per five acres, without specifying the lot size. I think part of it is in that case it's already been done, so we're 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 zoning what has already been built up in the old rules, and that's those are those areas. So it's been done. Yeah, it already exists. We're not we're not going to make people people take away what they already have. If 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 somebody wants to sell, we don't mean they have to take their house down. They have to destroy the house. They can't sell a house. They can just sell the land. Yeah. If we consider the pink zone a developed zone, then we don't. The, the, the question we're talking about now becomes moot. There, it, we don't expect more development in the pink area if you don't include the back acres in the pink area. Right, but you couldn't. But we want, you well, want the trouble is, it's back. not. It's not fully developed, though. Right. 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 You know, there there are those fields in between. You know, I'm, I'm you know unbroken road frontage, and we're saying we're going to fill oh. it in. The rules allow you to go to the back acreage. Well, and don't put them in the pink zone. In other words, define the pink zone as where we don't expect any more development. But it's, I feel like it's that's a little off topic of trying to decide what's in that zone rather than trying to talk about what the rules for that zone would be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so if, if we could come back to the density question, I think what Joel has pointed out is he would like to cut the max density, if someone was maxing out the density they could have in what is basically the existing zone. Um, the basic entitlement in, I'm talking about. In half, the entitlement in half for, for what I've called the suburban neighborhood zone. And we can forget about what it's called, but currently you're allowed two residential units on a lot and the and a lot density of five acres. And Joel is proposing to cut that in half to one residential unit per lot. Is there a buy-in for the two? With the understanding that you can buy in more. Yeah. Oh. The problem I have with that is when you get the rural one and rural two. Under current um, zoning, which doesn't mean a hill of beans because it's all on moratorium, you can put two <laughs> Uh, you can put a single family or a two family for every five acres. So you're going to move that from five acres to 10 acres. So you're cutting the, the dwelling units in half 
then you're c- cutting out a two family. So you're really cutting it down to 25%. Right. And again, my argument has been all along, the ability to develop land corresponds very much to the value of the land. So you're really decreasing the value of rural one and rural two by 75%. So I think you're being a little harsh. Why, why couldn't you put a two family house that's one, one building, not two different houses, but a two family house in that 10 acre parcel or that unit for the 10 acres of land. Well, you could, but, uh, but you, but no, you, you, not, you, you yes, have to, you have to, you have to buy, well, you either have, you either have enough acreage that, that you can put, you can put, you could put two or three or four you know, units on your, on that, on that one lot. But, but Joel, we can write this the way it's written now. One up to two residential units per 10 acres. Then you're still reducing in half the number of dwellings and making it more rural character without harming the landowner. So it sounds like there is still some contention about uh, both of these numbers. So I think we can say we need to talk about that more at the next meeting and move to the next column, um, which is <laughs> minimum, which is lot size. And it's not just minimum lot size because yeah. there are yeah. two things going on with lot size here. Yeah. In the suburban neighborhood zone, it's a minimum. There's no maximum. In the high priority preservation zone, there's a really high minimum. And then in the other two zones, um, lots can either be small or big is the conversation we've had in the past. Yeah, now less than two acres admits of, you know, an eco-village type development where the lots could be a quarter of an acre, say, with shared yes. services. Yep. Um, why do we have in the suburban neighborhood a two acre minimum? But it doesn't admit of the possibility of, of, of clustering there at all. Why is there no 2.1 to 9.99 acres in those areas, in 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 our residential one and two, rural one and two, yes. Yeah. the 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 idea there being that you're trying to uh, conserve open space, right? And if you and uh, large lot large lot sprawl is the best way to uh, eat up more land faster. Yeah, that's that's the thinking of either small or big and not in between. Not that there's any magic about 10 compared to 9.9, .9, but we have to draw the line somewhere. And that this is where I uh, thought we'd agreed to come down on it. So the goal right now is to decide what things we need to talk more about and what things we have a reasonable amount of consensus about. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, yes. I, is there any existing information uh, about implementations that look like less than two acres or more than 10 acres? Has anyone else done this and what are the results? No, I don't think I've seen someone else do this. Would it be it's worth- density to... averaging. It's not that different from clustering. It's just putting in an extra- Would it be worth trying to gain- We say they have to be 10 acre minimum, but there's a cluster subdivision option the way the town currently does, which is they say it has to be uh, two acres, but there's a cluster option that will allow the planning board to waive any of that. Or we're just being more specific about the parameters rather than just leaving it up to propose something to the planning board, which I think is good because I don't think the cluster provision has been applied very well in every case. The main problem being that it, it, it rarely applicable at all because most of our subdivisions have been one lot at a time. Yeah. Is it um, worth so trying we to are game essentially game running out of out of time and I've gotten comments from a few people in chat saying this is not helpful what we're doing. Um, we need to think about this and come back um, come back at the next meeting in a couple of weeks and discuss it some more. Um, and I, I think that's fair and I I I don't see any point in going on to the next column with the way this conversation is going. Um, you kind of so have to resolve. You kind of have to resolve the, you know, the columns as you go along because it, it dictates what happens subsequently. Sure. Right. I mean, we um, have to we have to agree on how many zones are going to be, 
and then what the, and then and then you know and then we have to deal with the density and then we'd have to deal with the lot yeah, Lots so it, it was my understanding that we had pretty much settled on what the zones were, um, but I, since there seems to be some contention still, I think we should, you know, make sure that we're ready to decide that as a group at the next meeting, um, and I think we can set this aside. Um, I also wanted to share a couple of other comments with the group. Um, I heard from several people over the last couple of weeks um, that something that's missing from these conversations is really a focus on what is good for the town um, and really thinking about the future of the town and the people who are going to live here in 50 years because it's very easy to get focused on, you know, what does this mean for my property? What does this mean for what happens right next to me? Um, and we are really charged with looking at how are we going to shape the town for the next 50 years? What kind of place do we want this to be? You know, what's the end game? Um, so I, I want to encourage people to do some thinking on that and how uh, this zoning can shape where we end up um, outside of you know, just the places that are most important to you, um, because we're really called to represent the whole town here. Um, so that, that long-term focus and, you know, setting aside um, the, the impacts that are directly to you should really be less important than thinking about the whole town and, and what that will be like when all of us are dead. Because as usually happens with zoning, uh, most of the change that's going to come from zoning is going to happen after most of the people who are involved riding it have kicked the bucket. Um, and that's probably the case here too. Um, mm -hmm. Especially since a lot of us are not spring chickens. But... Yeah, so that's just a, a reminder and, and some thinking about, um, about what we can do at, in the next meeting that will be productive. I'm gonna stop sharing this for now. I do wanna thank everyone um, for being here. I, I do think that there was some use to getting into this and I do think it's a really complicated task that we've taken on. And you know, it, for most people here, this isn't something that you've spent years studying. Um, it's something that we're, we're kind of figuring out. And we're also trying new things. We're looking at some ideas that aren't that common that not a lot of places have done. Um, so you know, it's, a, it's a lift. Um, what else? That we are, I know, rambled on past nine o'clock. Um, I did have a couple of emails. Maybe I'll share their comments in the synopsis in another email. Um, I wanna remind everyone that there's multiple ways to participate here. Um, you know, None of this is about just the people who are here. Um, so I am getting comments from people who are watching the videos online. Um, mm -hmm. People are reaching out through Facebook. People are sending emails. People are giving me calls. Um, and I encourage you to share the videos from this, the, um, the documents, talk to your neighbors. You know, this is about a, a much broader group than we can get to a Friday night um, meeting. So thank you for having that commitment for being here, but also please help um, expand the group of people that are hearing about this and being involved in it. If you could share, because we have, those of us here don't have any way of knowing what's been shared with you. Uh, and it should be influencing how we think as well. Mm -hmm. David, yeah, do you want I, to talk about the meet, the walk? Sorry. Um, yes. So um, it, I think this group will be interested in a slightly a different topic, but um, the Hamlet group asked to have a walk in the Hamlet. Um, and it was really Nancy's idea and she's headed it up and worked with me. And um, I am available on Wednesday at noon and at six. And uh, I didn't want to mess up advertising for this meeting by putting something out right before it. But I'll put it out this weekend um, that people can come and meet me at noon or at six on Wednesday. Um, you with two walks. Plan to talk about the Hamlet walk. Um, you know, it's, it's hard to do group walks and really get very far. I think we could walk from Town Hall to Bald Hill Road and up Bald Hill Road to the town owned parcel there and back. Um, and that's probably as far as we can walk unless somebody really wants to see something in a different yeah. area. Um, 
Is that where where yeah. people would be meeting you so, at town hall? At town hall. Yep. Um, this, this and six, hopefully six, the weather will cooperate. Um, if it is okay. terrible, you know, don't yep. come. I'll try to send out <laughs> an announcement canceling it, but I'm not going to drag people around if it's pouring rain. Um, we need the rain, but <laughs> I know. <laughs> Um, are you talking two different walks, David? A yep. noon and a six? Yep. Um, and I'm not talking about them being different things. I'm not talking about this being a big fancy thing. It's a come, it's a chance to come and chat, um, to walk and look and you know, talk to other people and talk to me. Um, you know, when I've done this in other places, we've gone to the places in the community that we really want to emulate. Danby doesn't have really <laughs> the Hamlet infrastructure to compare to. So we're not really looking at something that is exactly what we're trying to go for. Um, and th you know, that would be a different thing. We could you know, try to take a field trip around the county to other places. Um, but there was the desire to have some you know, physical context of the scale of things um, and a walk can help with that. And it's always mm -hmm. good just to talk to people. So that will be happening. Um, there were some questions about documents to share with people. Um, the, they are on the town's website uh, and also in emails that went out about this. If you're not on the email list, um, if you go to the town's homepage, which is townofdanbyny.org, on that page there is a form you can fill out and then you'll get all the emails. I'm gonna share that screen real quick and we can say good night. Thank you, David. Thank you. So um, if you go to the anyone... town webpage here, the form to get on the email list is right here on the webpage. Does anyone still have contact with Jason? Just because I know you mentioned the YouTube uh, YouTube channel and there's yep. two Town of Danby ones. One was started by Jason and I thought it, yeah. it's got one video on it. And I thought that was the one. So I didn't think that there was any videos shared. Oh. And then I found yeah. that one. So I was wondering if we could maybe get a hold of him and maybe have him like yeah. send us the one video that's on there and then get I rid of that I, one. I actually was talking to Jason today, not about mm -hmm. D&D, um, so about <laughs> roundabouts because um, we're planning nerds and that's what we do. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I'll talk to him. The, the issue with just continuing to use the one that he set up is that he tied it to his personal Gmail Gotcha. But it'd be nice if it wasn't there because I know when I search okay. Town of Mandy, there's two of them now. So yeah. Okay. If you would yeah. permit yeah. you one is your copy them to your website and have them all. Yep. Mm -hmm. I will see what I can do. Great. Thanks, folks. Thank I am going see to you all. Thank you, David. Good night. Good night, Good everyone. Good night. Good night. David, good job. Thanks. Thanks. Good night.